wrap up our, uh, our series on miracles, we're going to be talking about the power of united prayer. Now, there's a perception that prayer really isn't effective or if it's just a good feeling. You know, when you, when you get around people and, and you say, well, I just want to pray about it, they're like, all right, that's the religious stuff. Just go ahead and do whatever you're going to do. Because we know nothing's really going to happen anyways. It's just that if it makes you feel better, just go ahead and do it. If that's what your crutch is, come on, how many people have heard other people look at prayer that way? Maybe some of us have even looked at prayer. Though. What's the point? If God already knows what he's going to do, what's the point of, of praying? And so what's happened is this, this, this life of prayer has become almost a mockery. It's almost been, been looked at as something like, I guess if you need that for your life, but I'm strong, I don't need that. This is a weak person's or a weak man's or a weak woman's way of handling things. And so there's been a perception out there of what, what the world says, what prayer actually does. But we want to go into scripture and see what the actual word of God says about prayer. Well, I just want to say, because even as the church, as Christians, we have diminished, I believe, um, the whole idea of praying for each other and the power of it. You know, how many of us, don't, we're not going to raise hands because I think probably all of our hands would be in. Someone says, well, I need prayer. And you go, oh yeah, I'll pray for you. And then... We have never really pray for them, right? And sometimes we, we forget that there is actual power that leaves. And I want us to, I just want to say this. It says, let's pray has become spiritual lingo instead of spiritual power. Let's pray has become spiritual lingo instead of spiritual power. I think we as Christians have to be the first ones to understand the power of prayer. We have to be the first ones who rise up and go, okay, you know what? P prayer does change things. I'm not talking, you know, someone says they need prayer. The habit we've gotten into is if they ask for prayer, we immediately, in Jesus' name, we just declare healing on that side. We declare turnaround. Whatever it is they need, we just immediately do it. It doesn't mean you have to go into a prayer place for three hours for that person, but you do need to pray. And we have to understand that it's not just a spiritual lingo because we can all say the right things. But I don't want to be a church that says the right things. I want to be a church of power. I want to be a church that when we pray, things change, right? And so we've got to understand that the prayer we pray actually brings power. Now, one of the reasons why prayer is mocked is because the devil does not want you to know how powerful it is or how to use it. Did you just get this? This is really important because you have to understand that strategically they are having sales meetings in hell every morning and see how they messed your life up through the night. Come on, people. The battle, you're in a battle. You're being attacked constantly. He's trying to kill, steal, and destroy your life. And if he can talk you out of taking your authority by prayer and, and, and knowing how to pray and what to pray about, he's got you defeated because you can't tap into the power of God. But when you understand how powerful prayer is and what it actually does in people's, in, in your life and people around you, all of a sudden the devil realizes he's been, he, he's been pushed to the corner and now you can walk in with the, with the authority. See, because God never made you in, in, in this world to get wagged. He, he set you up to be the head. The head wags the See, when you get an understanding of how powerful prayer is, and we're going to go in and look at it through Scripture of what prayer actually did, uh, we want, I want the light switches to go off here this morning and say, my God, this is what I've been missing. See, when we get serious with God, God gets serious with us. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to try that again on this <laughs> side over here. I uh, said, when we get serious with God, He gets serious with us. Yes. So we want to be people that push through and understand what prayer is and how does it work. And as we go into scripture, I want you to just open your thoughts, your minds, and see, see where God wants to take you in this. You see, there's one common thread to all of the big miracles in the, the book of Acts and throughout this church, and that key is prayer. 
over and over, um, and we're going to look at some examples, but I look at even what God is doing in our church right now. We are seeing dozens of miracles every single weekend. Um, it, it's just over and over. People are getting, uh, they're coming to know Jesus for the first time ever. They are getting their bodies healed. They're having breakthroughs. They're, they're getting clarity in their life. All kinds of amazing life transformation. I love one, one man said it to us this way. He said, he says, I come in one way and every single Sunday I leave different. You know, and he's working in lives. But that doesn't happen because we have a perfectly lined up service, because we have just the right song picks and that we have just the right words to speak. That comes because we have prayed and we've invited the Spirit to come in. That comes because we are diligent in the fact that we cannot do this without the power of God. And so we need to be in prayer pursuing him. We, that's what we do on our Saturday nights. We spend extended time just in prayer and worship over this. Before our services, we have a prayer team that comes in and prays over every single seat in this auditorium. We do that in both of our campuses. You know, we, we understand the power of prayer. You guys are praying for this church. You guys are praying for us. Because of that, because we all have a heart to pray, God moves in greater ways. You see, it's not just, oh, us, man, okay, Pastor Gustavo, he had a good worship set there. No, they've come up prayed up. Okay, what you see is the manifestation of what they have prayed. We have prayed, you guys have prayed. The manifestation of our prayers is creating an atmosphere for the miraculous. We can't do it without prayer. We need to up, uh, we'll explain later, but we're gonna up the prayer we have over our services and over our region and over our areas because we need more if we want more from God, right? So, Acts chapter 4, 23 to 31. So here, Peter and John had been arrested. We talked about this story earlier in our series. But um, they had been arrested for preaching the gospel. Uh, they had been let go and told, don't preach anymore, whatever else. They go to the house where the other disciples were. And this is what happened. Uh, verse 23. As soon as they were released from custody, Peter and John went to the other believers and explained all that had happened with the high priest and the elders. When the believers heard their report, they raised their voices in unity and prayed. Okay, now there's this powerful prayer. Go through Acts 4 and read the whole thing. We're just going to skip down to verse 30. This is the end of their prayer. It says, stretch out your hand of power through us to heal and to move in signs and wonders by the name of your holy son, Jesus. At that moment, the earth shook beneath them, causing the building they were in to tremble. Each one of them was filled with the Holy Spirit and they proclaimed the word of God with unrestrained boldness. Woo. Okay, this is a prayer that literally shook the ground. Okay, you guys, we aren't getting this. Okay, guys, come to our Friday night encounter on Friday, and we're going to have an earthquake because we're praying. Okay, guys, we read scripture sometimes, and we just think, oh, well, yeah. An earthquake happened. Okay, guys, at the end of service, can you imagine if this whole building started shaking? But I want to show you a principle because... Um, we fight against not flesh and blood, but powers and principalities. So when we pray and take our authority, we take our authority in the spiritual realm. And then that spiritual realm manifests in the earthly realm. So essentially what happened here was they so shook the heavenly realm that the earth couldn't help but respond. Come on. They shook the spiritual realm so much that the earth and the natural realm had to respond. What if we prayed in such a way that the natural realm had to respond? Your situation had to respond. That's pretty big. Your, that sickness trying to take you down has to respond. That family problem that's going on has to respond because we have so prayed in the spiritual realm that literally the earth shakes. Guys, that's what we should be expecting. That's what we should see with the power of prayer. Now, if we realize, just look at this, if we realized our prayers can literally shake the spirit realm when we pray, we would pray a whole lot differently. Yes. Wouldn't we? Instead of, oh, thank you, God, for today. Just help me, you know, give me this, 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 and this. All of a sudden, we'd be like, Lord, I thank you. Lord, order my footsteps today so that I can be your hands and feet everywhere I have to go, Lord. I thank you, God, that wherever I go, I'm laying my hands on the sick and they're recovering. Lord, I thank you that you are moving in every situation I come in contact, that you're giving me wisdom, you're giving me insight. Yes. Yes. We're going to pray a little bit differently instead of, Lord, bless my cornflakes and help me to get through the day. <laughs> now, look. We're all in different places. If you're in a new walk with Jesus and that's all you know to do, then you do it with everything in you. Right? 
Lord bless my cornflakes and my banana and my toast, <laughs> right? But this is just talking to God. He wants to meet you wherever you're at, but he's looking at is your desire to get into prayer and start shaking the kingdom of darkness or are we going to back off, right? Now there's another example in Acts chapter 12, but here Peter was arrested for preaching. And this was about 42 AD, so the church already had been around for a little while, but it still wasn't popular to preach. Now, thankfully in Florida, we don't have that problem, but if you go to some of the other states in this union, you can still be arrested for preaching right now. Now people would say, this is, but this is the United States of America. I said, exactly. Do you think there might be an assault on the church today? I'm just asking that yeah. question so we can put it. But let's read this uh, in Acts 12. It says, Herod, you want to read it? Yeah, certain verse 3. Right, Herod had Peter arrested and thrown into prison during the feast of Passover. Sixteen soldiers were assigned to guard him until Herod could bring him to public trial immediately after the Passover celebrations were over. The church went into a season of intense intercession asking God to free him. So now I want you to see this because here he gets locked up for doing nothing but good. Come on, people. He wasn't robbing 7-Elevens for the love of Jesus. He was preaching the gospel. He wasn't killing people. He was preaching the gospel. How do people think bringing life to people's lives and preaching the gospel with miracles happening? How could you get locked up for that? But look, he got locked up for it, the Bible says. In the process of that, the church says, but wait a minute, we're going to do something. We're not going to just do a jailbreak on them. Because that could have been an option, get a coup together and try to figure out how to hit the jail at 2 in the morning or something. What did they do? They went to prayer. But the Bible says they went to an intense prayer. The Bible says that they got focused and zeroed in that he would get freed. Now it's interesting because we're going to go through and you're going to look at how he was locked up and you're going to say this looks impossible. How many people know that a lot of times things in your life can look impossible? There's no way you're going to make this happen. There's no way this is going to happen. There's no way I'm going to get a break there. That's not going to happen by God. I want us to continue reading this here. In verse 6, it says, The night before Herod planned to bring him to trial, he made sure that Peter was securely bound with two chains. Okay, so he's got 16 soldiers. He's got two chains. And Peter was sound asleep between two soldiers with additional guards stationed outside his cell door. Okay, so... This was maximum security. And okay? then some. And on then steroids. Some on steroids. Right. Yeah. Like, there ain't no getting out of this one. Okay? Can you imagine? Like, there is no jailbreak happening. 16 guards, guard, extraditional guards at the gate, one on either side, double chains. For preaching the gospel. It's okay, kind of funny almost. This but. is that impossible situation. That's that situation for you where you feel so chained down by your past, by the circumstances around you, by a financial, sh financial situation, by a family situation, by, um, you know, a, a diagnosis that you just feel like there is no way out. You don't, like there is no way out. I have looked, I have hired advisors and they've all told me there is no way out. Okay, that's in the natural. Was there a way out in this? Even the greatest jailbreak plan could not probably have pulled this off. So you understand that sometimes we, we are in these prison cells of situations. We're in chains. That addiction that's been through your family for 12 generations and you just cannot seem to, as much as you want it, you cannot seem to break loose. Those habits, those mindsets that, that just you can't seem to break out of, those are those chains that seem impossible. And it's easy to kind of give up. But here's what happened Look at in verse, verse 7. seven. When all at once an angel of the Lord appeared, filling his prison cell with a brilliant light, the angel struck Peter on the side to awaken him and said, hurry up, let's go. Instantly, the chains fell off of his Can wrists. Can I just say instantly? Instantly, right? At the beginning of that, it was an all at once. All at, in just a moment, God can change it. In a moment, God can change it. Keep the on. angel told him, get dressed, put on your sandals, bring your cloak and follow me. Peter quickly left the cell and followed the angel, even though he thought it was only a dream or a vision, for it seemed unreal. Everybody say unreal. unreal. He couldn't believe 
it was really happening. Now watch this. The church is praying and all of a sudden the supernatural stepped into the scene. An angel shows up. I mean, he's got 16. He's in the maximum, maximum, maximum secured prison. And he walks out like he's not even there, but he's thinking, I must be in a dream. Come on, sometimes when God does things in our lives, we think, I feel like I'm watching from the outside. I feel like I'm just in a dream because uh, there was no way I was going to get out of the situation that I was in. But God all of a sudden showed up. He was even, he, he had to pinch himself to see if it was actually legit. Did you get this? Peter, the great man of God, that his shadow would heal people. Peter, the great man of God, where he stood at the gate, beautiful, and grabbed what I have, take it, boom, people that were lame came. He was pinching himself. How many people think that God wants us to maybe be, still be pinching ourselves, that saying, is this really happening right now? See, we, when we have the God factor in it, everything can change. Let me say that again. When the God factor gets involved in your situation, everything will change. Yes. And when we start to see how God operates in this and the importance of this, why did this happen? Because what, you back up a few verses, because the what, the church was in what? Intense prayer. Let's continue in verse 10. They walked, this is the angel and Peter. It says, they walked unseen past the first guard post and then the second before coming to the iron gate that leads to the city. And the gate swung open all by itself right in front of them. So these are already impossible situations, right? Uh, they went out into the city and were walking down a narrow street when all of a sudden the angel disappeared. That's when Peter realized that he wasn't having a dream. He said to himself, this is really happening. Any of you ever been in a place where God shows up and is like, like, whoa, like that miracle is actually happening. The Lord sent his angel to rescue me from the clutches of Herod and from what the Jewish leaders planned to do to me. When he realized this, he decided to go to the home of Mary and her son, John Mark, and the house was filled with people praying. See, there is someone praying through till he got his miracle. And that's the kind of church we need. To, we need to be a church that prays people through their yes. miracle until they have manifestation, until our, our nation is healed, till our county is healed, till our city is healed, till, till the people in our family are healed. We need to be ones who continue to pray. But let's go on. There's kind of a fun part of this story uh, to end in verse 13. So Peter went and knocked on the door to the courtyard and a young servant girl named Rose got up to see who it was. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so excited that she forgot to open the door, but ran back into the house to announce Peter is standing outside. Can you imagine Peter like, hello, I just got out of prison. Um, and they said, are you crazy? They said to her, but then, but when she kept insisting, they answered, well, it must be his angel. Meanwhile, Peter was still outside knocking on the door. <laughs> Can you imagine this? Like, Okay, I, I thought they would have let me in, you know? This is pretty cool. Uh, but when they finally opened it, they were shocked to find Peter standing there. So I want to say here, this is a miracle beyond even what they were praying for. Okay, they were probably praying that he wouldn't be killed when he stood trial the next day. They were probably praying, Lord, keep him safe in the midst of his storm. But God's plan was, I hear your prayers, and I'm going to do exceedingly abundantly more than you could ever ask, think, or imagine. Come on. I'm not going to just protect him where he's at. I'm going to deliver him out. Man, we should be, as a church, expecting miracles that go beyond anything we can imagine. And then when we go, when it happens, and we go, whoa, like, whoa, Right? That should be our, like, I know every, every Sunday, when we start hearing stories of what you guys are sharing, what God's doing in your life, we go home Sunday afternoons and we literally are like, whoa. Because God is moving and he's changing lives. We can't do that. A service, good service lineup can't do that, but God's power and his presence sure can. Right? That's what we should be believing for is that it goes beyond what we had ever anticipated. So the key is the church went into a season of intense intercession asking God to free him. And while, everybody say while. While. They were praying, it got answered. There was no time delay. 
This is important for us to, to understand and realize because if Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, do you think he wants to do it again? Yes. Yes. Let me help you. I'm going to give you the answer. Yes. So a few years back, we had all these storms blowing into Florida, causing all this havoc, everybody panicking. I mean, one of them was so big, it was bigger than the whole state. It was supposed to wipe Florida off the face of the earth. And everybody was like, let's run. Remember three years ago? If you haven't been here. Hurricane Irma. Hurricane a category Irma. five hurricane. Everybody's in full panic mode. What are you going to do? I said, we're just going to stand and take our authority. I said, we're just going to pray intensely as a church. We're just going to tell that storm that, that our God is bigger than that storm. Come on, somebody. Everybody else is running for the hills, and you're going to stand. Well, how do you know you can do that? Well, Jesus spoke to the wind and the waves, and they obeyed him. You were made in the same DNA. You have the same likeness and image that Jesus had, and he says you'll do greater things than he did. I didn't come up with this. I'm just repeating it. So you get in the midst of a storm that looks insurmountable that's going to wipe Florida off the face of the earth and you stand there and you say, in the name of Jesus. See, watch what when you use the name of Jesus, every knee bows, every tongue confesses. Everything stops at the name of Jesus. The devil bows at the name of Jesus. Did you hear what I said? That means the storm bows at the name of Jesus. It's not an act of God. It's an act of the devil. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. God said, I came to give you a life and more abundantly. They call it an act of God. It ain't God. It's not Jehovah. It's knockoff. The devil. So he comes with this big destruction and the church stands up. Why is this important? Because the church is the bride of Christ. Man, he's, he's about to come back for his glorious church, his, his beautiful bride. Don't you think he wants her adorned? If you were getting married, wouldn't you want your bride adorned? Don't you want her to be radiant? Come on, people. We're, we're, we're the very breath of what God, what Jesus came for. We're his bride. It doesn't get more intimate. It doesn't get closer than that. He is not going to let his bride hang. He's going to back her up with everything he's got. Yeah. So when the bride stands up and says, I don't think so, that's the church. Again, this is powerful. The church says, no, this storm will not take us out. This storm will die in its course. We'll poke the eye out of the storm. We'll have it dissipate. It's amazing what happened. Well, can I just explain a little bit of what happened in here? Because many of you did not live here. How many of you lived here during that? Yeah, okay. When they said there was a six to seven foot storm surge, because this thing was going to actually come ashore in, Braden, in Manatee, Sarasota County. That's where it was making landfall. Okay, that's a huge category five, perfect eye. They said the most perfectly formed storm they had seen to that point. We said, you know, we're praying for this thing to fall apart. Do you know Tampa Bay, like the actual Bay of Water and Manatee River, the day before this thing made landfall, actually emptied of water. All the water got sucked out into the Gulf. If you were here, you, you remember that. Okay, for those of you who don't or watching online, it all got sucked out. Crazy weird. You could walk across a river, okay? <laughs> and, and the thing is then, when the storm came in, the water that came in just refilled what had been sucked out. They said it was this bizarre thing. The meteorologists were calling it a miracle of God because there was no other explanation. Right? As soon as that thing made landfall in Sarasota County, it was, they literally said it's like a part of the wall got poked out, which is exactly what we had been praying. And other believers in this area had been praying. We'd been joining together with other churches to pray. Right? And, and that thing went over. It, it made landfall. It actually went about a quarter of a mile. The eye went about a quarter of a mile from our house, went over it. I was hoping maybe to lose a few dead branches, right? Get them brought down. No, nothing happened, right? But, but that's the protection of the Lord. Did we lose? We lost power for a little while. Yes. Did we lose trees? Yes. But guys, we were spared. 
Why? Because some people are desiring to stand up with their authority, understand who they are, and stand and not allow the enemy to come in. That's the power of prayer. You see, prayer will break loose the chains of any prison cell or bondage. Prayer will break loose the chains of any prison cell or bondage. You can act, it, prayer will break the, the bondage of any storm, of any thing that comes at you. Prayer can change it all. Because I look at what is your situation. Maybe there's prison cells in your life. Maybe you feel like you can't get out of a situation you're in. Maybe it's your own making. Maybe it's not your own making, but you just feel trapped. Maybe there's addictions that you just feel like, I cannot get out of this. Maybe there's um, just situations where you feel oppressed in the, in the climate of everything that's going on in our nation right now. Maybe you just feel very in fear and oppressed at all these things. But here, prayer can break the, loose this. As we pray for our nation, we can break the chains that are trying to pull our nation down, that are trying to take it into a place of fear and chaos and everything else. We can make a difference, but we have to realize we have to pray. You know, I think in, if we look at what kinds of prayer there are and what kind of results they bring, there's one that's called fervent Persistent prayer, Acts 12, 5. So Peter... There's two things we're going to highlight to you, and yeah. this is the first one. Fervent, so, persistent prayer. So Peter was kept in prison, but fervent and persistent prayer for him was being made to God by the church. Acts 12. Yeah. Now I want you to see this, because what is fervent, persistent prayer? Oh God, if you're not busy... I'm wondering if you could cover this for me and could you bless my cornflakes as well on the side and is that fervent, persistent prayer? No. They got in and they said, no, we're, we're, we, got, we, we need a miracle. We, we need to press in like we've never pressed in before. We need to zero in and take authority over whatever's causing this, whatever's, whatever demons in hell are behind all this. We have to step in and we have to fight the good fight of faith. It, you're not physically fighting. You, they, they were just taking their authority to, to, to stand before God and, and say, God, we need backup. How many people realize that God knows you need backup? Amen. Is it okay to ask him for backup? Yes. yes. He says, I'm glad you finally came to me. Why are you even trying to do this on your own? But when we decide to, to press in, this is when we start to see miracles happen. Because we just say, I'm going to grab, listen, if i got to grab heaven's gates, I'm just, watch me, I'm just going to keep rattling them. Come on, I'm not letting go. I'm not backing down. God's, and all of a sudden, God says, hey, people believe me, let's do it. You know God wants your prayer answered more than you want it answered? Oh, it's quiet in here. I said, did you know that God wants to answer your prayer more than you want it answered? He wants to show himself mighty. God doesn't do anything half-baked. I mean, if they were 16 soldiers, they had him in maximum security prison, and an angel himself came in and everything, poof, just dropped off. You, you can't even really believe that. If somebody told you that story, you wouldn't even believe it. Oh, please. I mean, who was behind it? Like, what was really going on? Let's be serious. Maybe one of the guards was in on it. Maybe it was this. Maybe it was that. Nobody would believe you. Do you know God is the God that wants to do miracles when nobody will believe? Did you hear what I said? Because the church fervently prayed. See, when we as believers see how important this is, we won't push prayer off as a, as a, as a cop-out, as a last-minute resort. Because if you're in a court situation and it ain't going your way, I said it's best to get in there and get a group fervently praying, get the church out there. I need a breakthrough. I need the judge to see things they haven't seen before. I need something supernatural to break. Is that, is that okay to ask for that? Which is all things that pertain to life and godliness God wants us to have. Amen. See, sometimes we miss this and, and we take a step back and we just watch. We're spectators. God never called you to be a spectator. One of the translations of this verse says fervent, effectual prayer. And effectual prayer is not begging God. 
Persistent doesn't mean, oh God, please, 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 please. God, please, God, please. We have to understand that when we go to prayer, we need to be declaring and taking the authority that we need and declaring the word of God. Um, in our Mountain Mover series earlier this year, we talked about how too many times we're going to God telling God about our mountain instead of telling our mountain about our God. Come on. Right? So what we need to be doing is in Jesus' name, the power of God is going out into that situation. In Jesus' name, we release freedom. We release, we bind those chains that are trying to take him down. In Jesus' name, we call out sickness and command it to die in the name of Jesus. We, we stay in persistent prayer that is taking our authority not begging. Now the first miracle I shared with you today about the terminal illness, it was actually a brain terminal illness. And she says, I've been begging God for a long time to heal me. And she says, all of a sudden, a couple weeks ago, it clicked on me. And she says, I started telling my body what was going to happen, right? Taking your authority, right? Saying, no, God, this is going to happen in Jesus name. This is what's going to happen. And she's healed. You see, Praying is not, persistent prayer is not, okay, God, please. God, here's my list again, please. No, persistent, effectual prayer is taking the word of God and laying it over your issues of saying, God, this is what God says about my situation and situation you will line up. Now, I want us to look at so, James, James 5, 5 16. 16. It says, the heartfelt and persistent prayer of a righteous man, believer, can accomplish much, but when put into action and made effective by God, it is dynamic and can have tremendous power. And I want to talk about heartfelt, and then Joanne's going to jump in on the rest of it. What is heartfelt prayer? Praying like your very life depends on it. Did you just get that? That's not a passive prayer. A heartfelt prayer is saying, God, if you don't show up, this isn't going to work out. I'm going to be in big trouble. I need you in this situation now to step in. And if I messed up, forgive me, but I just need you to, like my life depends on this, God. I need you to show yourself mighty in my life. Does that offend God? He always says, I'm glad you're here. See, we think God wants to shake us off. Are you kidding me? He says, that when I show back up to the earth, will I even find people that believe me? Will I find faith? You know what faith is? Believing that he can do what he said he'll do. That's all it is. Yeah. So when you get to the point where you say, well, I don't know how this is going to work in the natural. How are you going to pay for this building, Pastor? That we're... I said, I don't have a hard clue. Not my problem. Want you the pastor? I said, yeah, but I'm not the owner of the church. I'm just the manager. I can go to the owner and say, we got some, we need some help. Are you getting this? If you get this revelation, it'll change how you think, how you pray. This isn't your thing to deal. Your battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against the powers, principalities, authorities, and you have authority over them because whatever Amen. you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Amen. So don't play that, oh, well, I don't know what's going to happen. Yes, you do. You're the head. You do the wagon. Amen. I've made you more than an overcomer. You can do all things through Christ who empowers and strengthens you. You've got to make that decision. Is that you? Come on. Say, yes, that's me. Listen, watch this. Your knees are shaking. It's still you. See, we need to be persistent, which means we're not going to give up till we see the manifestation. And we're not, I think too many of us give up right before our miracle. You know, we have sweet Laverne, uh, who's an awesome part of our church. And three years ago, she was hit by a car and is in a hospital room to this day, unable to walk or, or do a lot of things. But you know what? We believe she is healed and whole. Yes. And we are not going to give up. We are going to stay in persistent prayer as a church. We are going to continue to cover her with the blood of Jesus and the word of the Lord that says she is healed and whole and that she will be rising up. Because guess what? With God, time doesn't mean anything. Whether it happened yesterday or five years ago, it doesn't matter to him. He is still the healer. And will we stay in fervent, persistent prayer? Will we actually stay and pray till we see it manifest? You know, and sometimes you don't know. Like, there's sometimes what I call, it's kind of like a burden to pray, they call it sometimes, where you just feel unsettled about something. You know, I've had this many times. I wake up in the middle of the night, and all of a sudden I feel unsettled. Let me tell you, I start praying in the Holy Spirit. I start praying, and I start praying, and I start praying, and I don't stop until it lifts, until I get peace. 
And then I can't tell you how many times all of a sudden my, one of my kids will say, man, last night I was, I was driving down the highway and this guy almost took me out on the highway or I almost had a crash with a semi or whatever else. But because you are willing to get up and you don't even know what you're praying for sometimes, right? But pray it through. Pray it through till you see the manifestation. Now the second part of this I want to quickly go through. It says prayer grounded in unity. That's the key. Prayer grounded in unity. James 5.16. Confess and acknowledge how you have offended one another and then pray for one another to be instantly healed. For tremendous power is released through the passionate, heartfelt prayer of a godly believer. Man, so here it's talking about this passionate prayer like we were just talking about, but this is a little bit more of the verse. It says here first, basically, deal with your offenses first. If you want to be a church that has powerful pa- prayer that sees the earth shake, don't let offense get in. Don't let unforgiveness in. Man, but pastor, do you know what he said to me? Do you know who didn't smile at me today? I'm telling you. His joke was funny though. Yeah. Yeah. I just thought I'd throw that one in there. Or can you believe that pastor told a joke in church? Okay. (laughs) We both know how to pass the buck. It works pretty good. Um, but it's so easy for us to get offended and to realize, you know what, here it is. It, it, God is saying, get, it's not worth it. For what I want to do to shake this community, to shake our families for the power of God, it's not worth holding on to those things. Go, just make it right. You know, there's going to be times where each one of us have to go, oh man, my bad, I am so sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you. I'm sorry I did. And there's other times we're going to have to go to somebody and say, look, I forgive you. Right? You know, over 90% of all conflict is either a misunderstanding, a a misinterpretation, a misperception, or wrong information. 90%. Have a conversation. Let's not allow the enemy to bring offense in so that we can be ineffectual in our prayer. Right? Let's just love each other. Let's forgive. Let's be open to forgive. Let's be open to ask for forgiveness. But I want to read to you um, something about Charles Spurgeon. Okay? He's known as the Prince of Preachers. He was a minister in England in the 1800s who saw enormous blessings from God upon his ministry. It's not an exaggeration to say that thousands came to Christ through his preaching. Some of his services drew as many as 10,000 people at a time, but Spurgeon never took credit for the success of his ministry. Instead, he always pointed to the hundreds of people who came before services and prayed for God's blessing. He said any success he had came from God in answer to their prayers. Spurgeon was often fond of calling these prayer gatherings the church's boiler room. In Spurgeon's time, steam was the power source of the day. Boiler rooms were the powerhouses, the driving forces of everything from vast machines in factories to household heating systems. Boiler rooms, however, were not pleasant places to visit. They were functional, dirty, and hot, often tucked away in the basement. Likewise, Spurgeon saw the prayers of his people as the spiritual behind power behind his preaching and ministry. The prayer is not always easy, convenient, or when we want to take the time for it. It is the power place. And this is why he told his fellow pastors, and we've got this for you to see. We shall never see much change for the better in our churches in general till the prayer meeting occupies a higher place in the esteem of Christians. You know, we have got to realize that prayer is not always easy. It's not always convenient. We might not always even feel about it. But prayer is about so much more than just me and my needs. Prayer is about bringing God's will into our system, into our our church, into our community, into our nation. You know, so we're upping our prayer here. You know, uh, every, as we mentioned earlier, every Sunday morning from 8 to 8.45, we have a team praying through the, the auditorium. If you want to join them, come. They pray over every single seat in this place that God would touch each and every life. Come join them. Um, we do that in both of our campuses. Winnipeg is not meeting currently in, in person, but when they do, that's what they happens. In Florida, uh, Thursdays at 1 p.m., we're doing prayer from 1 to 2 here in the church, if you can make it. The first Saturday of every month from 9.30 to 10.30, we're going to be doing prayer. This is all in your bulletins. Uh, we're going to do, be doing prayer. We're going to be just seeking God for him to move. 
uh, in a Friday night, we have a Friday night encounter. We really, I believe this is going to go so much more than just a Friday night worship night. This is going to be encountering God in his presence. Last time we had a powerful, powerful time, but I believe it's even going to be greater. So come on out. Winnipeg, we're, we're doing something now that on our communion Sundays, when we do get together in homes, we're going to come an hour earlier than service, an hour before service, and have prayer. And um, just really shake that nation right now. But I wanted just to read you this. We've had hundreds of prophecies over our church and what God is going to do through it. But we've also had a lot of prophecies over uh, Florida. And this one was from June 2019. It says, over the years, Florida has been a key to international revival and prophets. Chuck Pierce and Dutch Sheets are saying it will happen again on a greater scale. And this is what they said. The entire state of Florida is going to be the key to another outpouring that this time is going to blanket the United States. And then it's going to flow out to the nations. In the spirit realm, I feel there's a hurricane coming of a ginormous move of God. And I believe that it's going to be a combination of all the previous moves. The healing movement, the worship movement, the river movement, prophetic movement, apostolic movement. I believe it's going to merge into a huge river with fire on top. That's the only way I can describe it. I want to be a part of this. I believe our church is to be part of this. You know, one of our prayer warriors here at the church, she, God gives her visions as she prays for the church on the weekends. And she says she's been praying and knowing revival is coming. But over the last month, she's actually seen pillars of fire, which represent a revival on the platform each week. Hey, it's here, but we need as a church to rise up in prayer and realize that each one of us have a responsibility to pray, to pray through, to make sure our, our community and our nation can be impacted and the world can be impacted by our obedience to pray. You know, before I give us an opportunity to make sure that Jesus is the Lord of your life, I want to share this because on Wednesday when we didn't ask for testimonies, they just start pouring in. God just showed up. And in the middle of that, I started to weep. My prayer was, God, how can you do something so supernatural with somebody so dysfunctional? God, how can you show up and give people breakthroughs when we don't have our act together completely? Come on, we're all there. We all don't have our act together completely. But God still wants to do something supernatural. You know, when these prayer clauses, when they said, we just need to do this, I said, yes, we do. I felt my spirit. The Lord says, just do it. But I didn't know what the outcome was, and we may not know until we get to heaven what it's all going to be. But as people have taken them and used them, God just spoke to me in the earlier service, and he says, when you take these, he says, tell them to go in boldness. Because I'll back it. It's not about what you can do. It's are you prepared to put yourself out there and say, hey, listen, my church prayed over these. We're going to just be believing for a miracle for you. You need a miracle right now. Just take this. I believe God's going to show up so supernaturally, it's going to shock us. I said it's going to shock us. Yes. It's going to be to the point where they're knocking. Is that really Peter? Did Peter say, Did I really? He's, we're, we're going to be pinching ourselves. God wants to do miracles at a greater measure than they've ever happened. Are we ready to participate with it? Thank you, Jesus. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to pray a prayer and make him the Lord of your life. There's people online, you just tuned in. You've been watching for the last 15 minutes. The Lord said, but this is why you're here, so you can give your life to him. Your life's a train wreck. You've been in fear, and he says, I want you to come out of that fear. I want to break that off your life, and I want you to live and run a life of victory with me. I want to pray a prayer right now in a minute. I'm going to ask everybody to repeat it after me. If you're online, wherever, whatever room you're in or wherever you're in your vehicle, whatever it might be, I want you to say this out loud as we pray it. Because the Bible says when you speak it with your mouth and you believe it in your heart, God will sh change your life in a real and tangible way. Pray this with me. Father, in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name. I ask that you'd forgive me. I ask that you forgive me. Come into my life. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my Savior. 
be my savior. And help me to live for you. And help me to live for you. Every day of my life. Every day of my life. And fill me now. Fill me now. With your Holy Spirit. With your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Amen.